Explosives from Russian drones practically rained down on this street last night in the town of Konotop in the Sumy region, northern Ukraine. At least 14 people were hurt, no one killed. It's from this region that the Ukrainians launched their offensive into Russia last month, one of the biggest twists in the story of this war. The Russian Ministry of Defence released these pictures this afternoon, though, purporting to show their efforts to retake a number of settlements in the area. Western officials told us that Russian counterattacks have started, something acknowledged by President Zelensky today. The Russians have begun counteroffensive actions, but this is what we had planned for. After their surprise incursion into Russia's Kursk region at the start of August, Ukraine says it's holding about 500 square miles of Russian territory, although it looks like Moscow's counteroffensive has started. It's on the eastern front, though, where Russian gains over the summer have come into particular focus. Since June, they've advanced quickly in the direction of the key town of Pokrovsk, although that has slowed down in the last few weeks. Vladimir Putin met with a senior Iranian security official today. The meeting comes as short-range Iranian-supplied missiles are expected to be used in Ukraine in the coming weeks. That's added to the urgency of a flurry of diplomatic head-to-heads. For Ukraine's part, it awaits permission from the US, allowing them to use long-range Western-supplied missiles to be fired deeper into Russia. Anthony Blinken's language today suggested an announcement on that could come soon. I can tell you that uh, as we go forward, we will do exactly what we have already done, which is we will adjust, we'll adapt as necessary, including with regard to the means that are at uh, Ukraine's dis disposal to effectively defend against the Russian aggression. And in the last couple of hours, Vladimir Putin was asked about the same thing. This will mean that NATO countries, the United States and European countries are fighting against Russia. And if this is so, then bearing in mind the change in the very essence of this conflict, we will make appropriate decisions based on the threats that will be created for us. There are a host of big diplomatic moments coming, the UN General Assembly next week for one. But the big question now is what form the punishment from Russia will come in against Ukraine and against the people fighting on its behalf. Paul Cabrian reporting. Well, I'm now joined here in front of the Reichstag by Hans Jens Zimmermann. He's a senior member of the Social Democratic Party, the SPD of the Chancellor Olaf Scholz. Thank you very much for joining us here. Good evening. Jens Zimmermann, it's good to see you again. Um, let's start with Ukraine. Uh, this government is very, very firmly in favour of helping Ukraine win this war, at least not get defeated by Russia. Where does the German government stand on long-range weapons that could be used inside Russia itself? So the Chancellor made it clear over and over again that we have a thin line of escalation. And I fully understand that uh, Ukraine is eager to get these weapons and to use them for their offensive. But um, Chancellor Scholz is closely talking to President Biden. And uh, so there is this red line, and I don't see that we leave that. OK, so just very briefly on this, if Pe President Putin, as he did today, threatens that this war would escalate into a much wider war involving NATO, involving Germany, um, would that make you think, no, we're not going to allow weapons, German weapons, to be used inside Russia? So we don't listen to threats like that yeah. because I don't think it makes any sense. The contacts to Putin are completely gone. I mean, at the beginning of the uh. war, they had him on the phone constantly. That has gone far, far away. Uh, we don't listen to threats like that. OK, let's move on to the freedom of movement and the Schengen Agreement. This is a sacred pillar of the European Union, and your government is going to impose border controls at the crossings into your nine neighbours, which some of them are very upset about. Is that literally just a political gesture to take this, the wind out of the AFD sails? So first of all, we have a lot of these controls for the whole summer. We had the Olympics in Paris. We had the European champions in Germany. So these controls are in place for months now. And during that time, we had like 30,000 people at the borders who were sent back. Yeah. And I have to make that point. 
we had a tragedy in Solingen, yeah. a stabbing, three deaths. And this is, um, this is the case why we say we need these controls. But the fact that you've announced it and made a big deal out of it now before the elections in Brandenburg, that shows you that how scared this government is of the AFD, doesn't it? I wouldn't say that we are scared, but the people expect from this government and all parties that we deal with that threat. It was the second stabbing um, and we see ISIL is not dead mm. um, and we have to deal with that and uh, these are appropriate measures. There are also reports that this government is thinking about introducing, introducing much harsher kind of welcome packages for refugees coming in. What the AFD, and you saw this in my report, called, you know, uh, a bed, some bread and a piece of soap which is pretty reprehensible. Are you going to do the same? No, no, no. That's ridiculous and it is not on the agenda. We have uh, rules and regulations in Germany. We love them and they also apply for refugees who are coming to our country. We have over one million Ukrainian refugees taken into mm. Germany. We are taking good care of them and we will give shelter to everybody who can apply uh, seeking asylum in Germany. Your party is nationwide polling, I don't know, 14, 15 percent. In some of the southern eastern states, 5 percent, 6 percent. I mean, this is terrible. You're the party of Willy Brandt and Helmut Schmidt. These were different times. And during that time, we only had like three parties in the Bundestag. Now we have seven or eight. But um, it is difficult times. And especially in these two eastern German states, we were not performing well for the last 20 years. But today, there's a new poll in Brandenburg, which sees us at 26 percent, which is uh, very promising. But it shows it is neck in neck unfortunately with the far right mm. with the populist right and um, I'm very concerned about that that's for sure there are serious German political observers and academics who've been saying that what's happening in that building there the Reichstag is reminiscent of the Weimar Republic right is that overblowing it somewhat I mean as a German politician I'm extremely conscious about our history and unfortunately I have to agree um, I you have, agree with that? I have to agree that the language of the populist, the far right, the far left, it has sometimes, they are using the same techniques, but I'm convinced that the parties of the center won't do the same mistake they did 100 years ago. We'll be watching. Jens Zimmermann, thank you very much. Thank